Michelle and uh, from the sublime that we got from Judith down to the very practical. As, uh, as Michelle said, um, is the, I beg, beg your pardon, can you hear me now? Mm -hmm. you know, my voice is, doesn't carry too well. So. so I'm going to talk today about the CNIB library and uh, exactly what we do as an authorized entity since having attended a few of the SCCR um, meetings in the past and had people come up to me afterwards and, say, and ask that question. We're working on the Marrakesh Treaty. What exactly is it you do as an organization uh, serving people who are blind or partially sighted? So Michelle asked me to speak about that today. So. Welcome to a virtual tour of the CNIB Library. So the building you see on the left is the CNIB headquarters in Toronto. This is also the home of the CNIB Library. Sorry, my English is going here. Um, what you see in the photograph on the right, those of you who are watching the screen, is two of our staff who are also clients of the CNIB entering the building with their guide dogs. The CNIB library is fully digital, so our materials are delivered directly to our library users wherever they live in Canada. So we don't see too many of our clients actually walking through the door as you see these, uh, these two individuals. CNIB Library is similar to other public libraries in many ways. We use the same cataloging rules. We, um, in most of the services are very, very familiar to a public library. However, this presentation will focus on ways in which we and other authorized entities are indeed different. First of all, a little bit about the environment in which we operate in Canada. 3.4 million people in Canada live with print disabilities, and that's about 10% of our population. And of this, over 800,000 are blind or partially sighted. So why this keeps jumping on me? I'm also sure you're aware that 7% of internationally published works are available in formats that uh, people with print disabilities can actually read. <coughs> So this statistic comes from the United Kingdom, from a study that was done at the University of Loughborough. <coughs> CNIB Library is the largest public library type accessible collection for people with print disabilities in the country. We have over 85,000 books in Braille, in e-Braille, in print Braille, e-text, DAISY, and online audio formats. We also provide a gateway to many other services on the web that are also considered to be accessible. We also narrate magazines on a monthly basis for our clients and provide access on a daily basis to over 50 local, national, and international newspapers in text-to-speech format. And there's, there's much more than that, but that's the, those are the key services. Here you have some of the programs that are unique to uh, the services provided for people with uh, print disabilities. Here are a few examples of uh, our paths for literacy for children who are blind or partially sighted. Our tactile for taught kids, for example, kids, for example, contains information for parents to help them read with the children and interpret tactile images. Our Braille Creative Writing Contest requires that kids write in Braille in order to enter. And our very popular print Braille books are for early childhood <coughs> intervention. The purpose here is that these children's books are like any children's books, except we have interleaved print Braille pages in between each of the pages in, trans, uh, in translucent paper, so that a child who is blind can follow with their fingers and listen to the words that their mother is saying, don't know the relationship between those dots and the words yet, but will when they go to school, just like a sighted parent when reading to a sighted child, will show the child the words, and the child knows that, I don't know what these words mean, but when I go to school, I will. So the same, same idea. We have a reader advisory service because I mentioned that our services are completely virtual. 
These are staff who manage by phone, by email, and by, uh, by phone, by email, and online. It's a team of advisors who <coughs> register new clients for services, make reading suggestions, and assist users with various adaptive technologies. All the reader advisors um, work out of Toronto, but serve clients all across the country. We take about, as it says here, 45,000 inquiries a year. The young man you see on the screen is one of those readers' advisors. He himself is blind and is using a refreshable braille display to read with his fingers what is on the computer screen. Now a word about our uh, library's website, <coughs> which is the online interface for our services. Through it, people can discover what's in our collection, they can order books to be mailed to them, or download the books, and they can connect with other people with print disabilities. The website was designed in collaboration with our users. It is accessible in that it meets the W3C standards for web accessibility, but more importantly, it is usable. <coughs> Mainstream commercial online book services do go a long way to making their collections accessible, but in terms of usability, they still can present quite a challenge to navigate when you can't see the screen. Every function in our digital library website was tested with screen readers and magnifiers. Indeed, we tested over 1,000 permutations before we launched the website, and we still got lots of inquiries from our users about access challenges. A quick word about the usage of our services. Last year, we circulated 2.6 million books, magazines, and newspapers to people across the country. Our newspapers come in a format that is laid out especially for people using screen readers. And unlike major online editions of the paper that come with lots of advertisements <coughs> and pictures, we strip out all the graphics, all the advertisements, so that people can navigate plain text versions of the paper by section, by article. <coughs> now let's turn to what makes us really different from a regular public library. And the first thing is that we make all our alternative format books. Either we make them from scratch or we acquire them from other producers. But even then, we still have to transform them in order to align with our digital asset delivery system. We produce in audio, and that's human narrated audio, some text to speech, braille, and electronic text. As I mentioned, all our formats are digital, thus the backbone of the whole operation is a digital repository, which holds our collection. Our repository currently has 188 terabytes of storage, but reassuringly, it is scalable. So as we get bigger, it can get bigger. And a lot of what I'm showing you today is really the forerunner of what a lot of public libraries will look like in the future. Those of us who are in um, the business of providing books for people with print disabilities have had to be in this business a lot faster than regular public libraries, but they're coming close behind us. So, this slide shows someone in front of a computer, and a lot of our slides do, but it is showing an operator in our e-publishing area. This particular op operator is partially sighted and is using zoom text to signify or to significantly enlarge the font size. We start all production with an electronic file. Like any publisher, we want efficiencies. We want a master file that can be transformed into dis different formats. When you think of the print paradigm, the print publisher wants to create a master file once that supports a print book to be sold in stores or on Amazon, but also might want an Adobe edition and an e-book edition. We are very, have very similar needs. We want a file that can be transformed into multiple accessible formats, such as Braille. Our hope is that EPUB, the EPUB 3 standard for publishing, which has DAISY navigation embedded, is gradually 
going to be incorporated by commercial publishers into their production stream, which will provide the opportunity for more co content to be truly accessible at source from the publisher. And over time, this is expected to significantly impact the need for operations such as ours to produce quite as much as we have to do today. A word now about recording audiobooks. Here you see one of our 300 <coughs> audio narrators and technicians in our recording studios. We record more than 600 new audiobooks every year, as well as the magazines I mentioned. Most of our users are in the senior, even senior, senior years, and they've read print all of their lives until losing their vision later in life due to macular degeneration, diabetes, or glaucoma. The easiest format for them to transform to is a narrated audiobook. Hence, it is the most popular format among our users. But an important part of our production and services is Braille. Here you see a picture of our shelves of embossed Braille books. And what the books look, look like them in, their, themselves. In addition to Braille embossed on paper, we also produce eBraille in our collection. eBraille is read, as I mentioned, by a refreshable Braille display like the one you saw the reader advisor using. Braille is a low use but a high need medium for its users. These are usually people blind from an early age or birth. They have been educated in Braille, they go through school in Braille, and Braille leads to their higher education and their independence. They are almost a different market, to use this term, than a senior who becomes blind later in life. This is just a picture of our uh, Braille embossers. We emboss about 300 books in-house every year in addition to the Braille we acquire from other organizations for and of the blind. Today these, these books are translated from an XML file into a Braille-ready file that goes through Braille translation software. The only human intervention that's required is to proofread the book to ensure its consistency with the print edition. Once the book is produced and ingested into a digital repository, they're available for clients. CD is still the most popular delivery medium, and on the screen, if I if it can just stay on the screen, <laughs> is one of our CD duplicator um, units. We have many of these in our system. On a nightly basis, we burn uh, CDs, probably about 4,000 of them a night, and in, in essence, one book is created and burned to a CD for mailing every six seconds. So it's a, it's a fairly um, sophisticated process. So the books are ready to go out. And again, we have an automated process to actually send them out the door. I mentioned we distribute about 4,000 CDs across Canada, free of charge under the Canada Post Literature for the Blind program. The CDs come back and go through an automated process where they, they go through a system. The, the CDs are stacked in a hopper. We mechanically separate the CD from its envelope, read the barcode label, and our library system then knows that the client is, has returned the books and is eligible for more service. As you can see on the picture on the right, the hundreds of returned CDs, this is definitely the form of distribution that most of our clients prefer today. But CDs are reaching the end of their life cycle. So what's next? While we have a lot of clients who are independent computer users and can download from our system to iPhones, Androids, and computers, we also need to support those users who do not have access to a computer, will never have the opportunity to proficiently learn how to use newer access technology, or perhaps have other physical conditions that prevent them from being able to do so. In other words, in our situation, about 90% of our users who take the CD service today. So how do we bring these users 
to, with us on the post in the post CD era. The picture on the left shows two audio reading devices. They look the same as the reading devices that CD users use today to read their books. The difference is that these latest models are internet enabled. Using the new DAISY online delivery port protocol, we can deliver audiobooks directly to these internet enabled players without the user having to have a computer, that is to say, without a computer in the delivery channel. In between the two players on the screen, you can see a wireless connector, which connects the reading device to the internet. So, instead of selected books being sent from our digital repository to a CD duplicating system for mail out, they are placed on a virtual bookshelf created uniquely for each client, and when the client powers up their internet-enabled player in the morning, it connects to the internet and downloads the books that have been selected for the client, or that indeed that they have selected themselves. As one tester said while we were piloting this service, it's just like magic. This virtual service was launched just pa this past week to the clients, to new clients, to our services. So now a word about copyright law within Canada that allows us to create and distribute these copyright protected works in accessible format. In 2012, the new Canadian Copyright Modernization Act came into effect. This allows anyone with a print disability as defined in the Act to take published work and convert it to an accessible format that meets their specific needs. But it also allows CNIB as a trusted intermediary, as we were referring to it at that time, to make those works, works accessible for our members. In neither case is the publisher's permission needed. The new Act contains certain clauses with respect to export and import, which are new. These describe the conditions under which we can exchange alternative format works, in a, to another country for the use of their people with print disabilities in that country provided one, that the author of the work is a citizen or a permanent resident either of Canada or the country to which the work is being sent and that two, commercially available version of the work is not being marketed in the requesting country. With regard to import, the Act says that a copy made outside of Canada does not infringe the copyright law if, had it been made in Canada, it would have been made under a limitation or exception within the Act. So I've talked a lot about what our unique services look like how we as producers produce alternative format works, the flexibility of our delivery to our end users, and the laws within Canada that permit us to do what we do. Now before I close, a word about, a word about the, our participation in the Tiger Project. As many, or I expect most of you know, this is an international initiative of the WIPO Stakeholders Platform to increase the quantity of accessible published works available to people with print disabilities worldwide. As you'll appreciate, if organizations like ours around the world are not all producing the same titles, but rather exchanging what each produce, we can increase the overall quantity of accessible titles available. Tiger is publishers, authorized entities such as the CNIB, and WIPO working in collaboration to facilitate the operational <coughs> processes for this cross-border exchange. There are currently over 20 countries participating in TIGER. This includes publishers and authorized entities in the United States, Scandinavia, Europe and Australia, as well as developing countries in Africa and South America. In Canada, where about half our population has a mother tongue other than French or English, our two national uh, official languages, the ability to provide accessible titles in other languages is becoming increasingly important. Our participation in TAGR 
will assist us in achieving this end. Those of us participating in Tiger look forward to the ratification of the Marrakesh Treaty to improve the copyright clearance process within Tiger, which in turn will allow us to exchange more accessible works and more expeditiously, which is a good thing. So that's it for me. Thank you.